So as I've gotten more comfortable with my mill, I've started trying to push the speeds and feeds a little bit and remove more material faster. And one of the problems I've found is that it, it can get pretty loud. I'll play a little video here and you can uh, hear how loud it is. It's a little tough to tell from the video, uh, but it was getting so loud that I was needing to wear ear protection because my ears were starting to hurt if I listened to it for over, you know, a half an hour of really loud milling operations. And there are some tips and tricks to milling more quietly. And some of these are things that are I'm not going to cover. Things like reducing the stick out of the tool or improving your work holding, making sure that the work holding is, is holding the thing very securely. But there are a couple other things that I found that I wanted to share, which are kind of interesting. And the first one has to do with the way that I'm putting the mill onto my workbench. My workbench is made with a three quarter inch plywood top and I noticed that the top was actually pretty resonant. So when I uh, would drop something on it, you could hear it sort of uh, amplifying the sound of the impact. So to try to address this, I just kind of threw the kitchen sink at it. The first thing I did is I got two pieces of uh, heavy MDF that were uh, each three quarters inch put that on top of the workbench. Then I put a layer of neoprene sheet that was for noise isolation. And on top of that, I found some granite tiles just at Home Depot. Uh, and these are a half inch thick and two feet by one feet each, and they were very heavy. And then on top of that, I found some sorbethane, which is a type of isolation damping and absorption material. And then I put my mill on top of that. It's hard to see in the picture, but it is what it is sitting on. I wasn't sure exactly which duro, which hardness I needed, and I also wasn't sure how thick I needed, so I made an estimate based on what was available to me. And this helped a decent amount. But there's also something else that I found helped a lot, which was uh, actually looking at the feeds and speeds. For that first cut that I showed, uh, I was using a 50 thousandths of an inch radial width of cut, 100 thou depth of cut, and I was using a two foot cutter. And what's interesting is you can see on this graph down below the instantaneous cutting force as the tool rotates around 360 degrees. Because this is a two flute end mill, there are two spikes, one in the middle, one on the ends. And you can see that uh, because this is about a 20% step over, the tool is entering the cut and then that tooth is leaving the cut completely and the force is going down to zero until the next tooth comes around and starts entering the cut. I have some information in the description about this piece of software. So if we take a look at a three fluid end mill, this is a three fluid end mill now with a 45 degree helix. And what's interesting, if you look at this end mill, is that as the top tooth is exiting the cut, if it's a certain depth of cut, the new tooth at the bottom will just start entering the cut. And so you can end up in this situation where just as this other tooth is leaving, the new tooth is entering the cut. And so the instantaneous cutting force is relatively constant. And you can see this, this is a 15% step over, so 0 0.0375 width of cut, and it's a quarter inch depth of cut, so quite a lot deeper cut. But that quarter inch depth of cut is important because that's about the right depth of cut for a three fluid end mill at a 45 degree helix to be able to maintain relatively constant cutting force. And so if you actually look at the cutting force on the graph, it's staying quite a bit lower. The other one was peaking up to 16. This one's staying just over eight and it's not falling all the way down to zero. It's just oscillating a little bit around that eight mark. The absolute magnitude or the amplitude of the vibrations are gonna be smaller. And if you look at the material removal rate, it's actually about double what that previous cut was. And you can see that also reflected in the power, horsepower from the spindle this required is also about double, and so are the tangential cutting forces. But what I've found is that in these types of mills that are pretty lightweight, the tangential cutting force is not too important. What's more important is the uh, rigidity of the machine and the damping of the machine, which is usually pretty low. And so it actually makes sense to optimize for a cut like this, where you're trying to reduce the amount of vibration in the cut, even though you're 
uh, causing a higher cutting force on average. So when I first tried this out, I was a little worried. I was a little nervous that it would be really loud or vibrate the machine a lot or who knows what. But what I found was that it was almost a silent cut. And you can't really tell in this video because you can uh, obviously hear it. The microphone picks it up. But compared to everything else, when this is inside the enclosure, it's actually very difficult to hear. And you can kind of tell in the video because you can hear the spindle all the way through and you can hear the spindle bog down. And so the amount of uh, volume from the actual cutting is very low. The end mill I used was a YG1 3 flute 45 degree helix end mill, which is uh, great. If you haven't used these outlet power end mills, they have mirror polished flutes and they do a great job on aluminum. You get great finishes. And so that's the second tip. And with these two together, I'm able to get really nice, uh, quiet milling operations. And because the material removal rate is doubled, I'm actually sped up my milling. So that's a win-win. And that's it.